know, this guy was in here the other day talking to me. And he said, hey, there's something screwy in the world. The people without guns are winning. <laughs> Let's go live to Tafir Liberation Square. We can speak to a freelance journalist who joins us on the line now. Rory, we were hearing about those heightened security measures today around Tafir Square. Is there a different atmosphere here compared with, say, yesterday and the day before? I mean, yes, it's an incredible atmosphere today. That cross-section of Egyptian society that left uh, Tahir Square yesterday is back in force now. They've managed to re-energise the protest. There's very young children, women, older men here. People are singing and dancing. There are many instruments in the square. And it's more full here than it has been in days. Anything that I mess up, you you fix, right? Ah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, fix it. Yeah. You fix it. Yeah. My name is Gene Sharp, and this is the work I do. What do you do? How do you describe your work? Oh, that's always a problem, describing my work. Because it doesn't fit a lot of the pe people's con preconceptions. Primarily, I try to understand the nature and potential of nonviolent forms of struggle to undermine dictatorships. is a technique of combat. It is a substitute for war and other violence. We don't know quite how it spread, but it certainly did into 30 some languages in different parts of the world on all continents except Antarctica. Famous 198 methods. I, this seems to have been yet yeah, an extraordinary response. That's simply the 198 specific methods, the specific forms of strike or economic boycott or civil disobedience or protest. Exactly the kind of counterpart of military, different kinds of military guns or bombs in a military struggle. Unless they have something instead of violence and war, they will go back for violence and war every time. I 
I came to work at the Albert Einstein Institution very shortly after graduating from college and I had been concerned about the world. It was 2001. It was a very interesting time to be entering the workforce and I was thinking about entering some development field, working for a charity, an NGO uh, that's very consistent with my family background. I had ideas about the world, about violence, about conflict, coming from Afghanistan that's seen a great deal of conflict and sort of growing up with that history uh, as a backdrop to my childhood really and having been a refugee at a very young age, I had ideas about how conflict should be waged and the need for conflict really. You know, I, I had perceptions of the anti-war community and the peace community as being really naive, that people are not going to give up violence, uh, and that they should not, that some conflicts must be waged. But at the time, I did not know there were very powerful alternatives to violence. So I began learning about the work um, at a very basic level. I did most of my reading and learning as soon as I started working at the institution, and I was hooked. I didn't start out to do this. I had a religious background that led me to want to leave the world in a bit of a better place and better condition than when I came here. And how to do that was always a problem. I was maybe 25 or something like that. I, I took a civil disobedience position against military conscriptions. And so I went to prison. Uh, I had a two-year sentence. I did nine months and 10 days. In those days, you, you counted the days as well as more. But I don't think that my action there did any good whatsoever. And, but uh, it was just to keep my sense of my own integrity so I would carry on in work that I thought was really important. I never met Einstein, but I wrote to him. I, I don't know how I got his address. I said, well, I'm about to do such and such and go to prison. But by the way, I've, I've, I've written this book on Gandhi, three cases of Gandhi, three di quite different cases from each other of Gandhi's using nonviolent struggle for greater freedom through not, just nonviolent means. And he wrote back that he was very much hoped that he can't know, couldn't know, but he hoped he would have made the same decision I did and he would be willing to look at the manuscript and, which I had sent to him. And he did so and, and, and wrote a very kind uh, uh, introduction to the book. If you can identify the sources of a government's power, such as legitimacy, such as popular support, such as the institutional support, and then you know on what that dictatorship depends for its existence. And since all those sources of power are dependent upon the goodwill, cooperation, obedience, and help of people and institutions, then your job becomes fairly simple. All you have to do is shrink that support and that legitimacy, that cooperation, that obedience, and the regime will be weakened. And if you can take those sources of power away, the regime will fall. And that was a, a sort of eureka moment, that this was not just a theory, and this was something that actually had been applied in many different historical cases. And that was very, very important. And how did you feel at that point? At the point the, the 
that Eureka point? Yeah. Oh, greatly relieved. <laughs> greatly relieved because that's what made it all re reality. When the U.S. Department of Defense and other countries sometimes sent special people to Harvard University for a year of doing something different. I had a program within the Center for National Affairs on nonviolent sanctions on nonviolent forms of struggle. I first met Gene Sharp at Harvard University. I was an Army senior fellow up there for a year. And uh, one day I saw a notice on the bulletin board about program for nonviolent sanctions at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So I had nothing to do, so I went to see who these peaceniks were and uh, to confirm my preconceived notion that they probably had rings in their noses and ears and uh, dirty. And so I went up there just to see them. And surprisingly, they weren't there. I saw, you know, regular looking people there. And a few minutes after we all sat down, this little short, soft-spoken gentleman comes to the front of the room and says, my name is Gene Sharp, and we're here today to discuss how to seize political power and deny it to others. I say nonviolent struggle is armed struggle. And we have to take back that term from those advocates of violence who try to justify with pretty words that kind of combat. Only with this type of struggle one fights with psychological weapons, social weapons, economic weapons, and political weapons. And that this is ultimately more powerful against oppression, injustice, and tyranny than is violence. That got my attention. This is the flag of the 5th Battalion, 7th United States Cavalry. The 7th Cav, as you know, was uh, the regiment of General Armstrong Custer, who fought it and died at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. That's me in my younger days. Full head of hair. <laughs> this is uh, the award for the Distinguished Service Cross that I got in uh, Vietnam. I think Vietnam influenced my view about the importance of nonviolent struggle and particularly the importance of getting Gene Sharp's ideas out to the rest of the world because we must have an alternative. Vietnam convinced me that we need to have an alternative to killing people. For more than 15 years, Manipur has been the headquarters of the Korean National Liberation Army. The opposition National Coalition Government of the Union of Burma is based here. They moved to Manipur after the military regime refused to recognize the victory of Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi and a pro-democracy party in the 1990 elections. I had retired from the army and uh, was doing some consultation work with the Korean National Union and we conducted a series of, of courses for the leadership of the democratic opposition which resided in the Karen state and so I asked him to come over to uh, conduct an evaluation of the training since it was his material his ideas that we were presenting so Gene came over and I had someone meet him in Bangkok 
and uh, well, they came to Mesot, and then from Mesot they took a truck north and then went to a site at the Moy River, put him in a boat in the Moy River and took him on to Manorplaw. No, it was an illegal entry into, uh, into Burma. And what they, what they do, or what they did at that point, was there was a Burma Army outpost up on the mountain looking at the site where the boats would come in and out. So you would have to wait until somebody gave you a signal that there was nobody watching. And that's when you went down to the boat carrying an umbrella so they couldn't see who was under the umbrella. Well, shortly after they got started, we got a message uh, on the radio that uh, the boat was coming and there was a white man with a big suitcase coming up river. And of course, there was no place to go but Manorplaw, so he was coming to Manorplaw. And when uh, the boat pulled over to the, to the beach, I went down to the riverbank to meet him and Gene was climbing out of the boat and I said, Dr. Sharp, I presume. <laughs> And he got a kick out of that. The whole objective of adopting the strategic nonviolent conflict on the part of the democratic opposition was to remove the military dictatorship. I was talking to one of the Karen commandos, <clears throat> and he had come by the classroom, and he was looking in the window, and he stayed there for over an hour, hour and a half. And then that evening, he came over to, to where I was staying, and he says, where in the hell has this information been? We've been fighting and killing people for 20 years. And how come we didn't know this? Some of the Burmese came up to him and, and asked if he would write something for the Burmese on how to move from a dictatorship to a democracy. That's the origin of why the book was written the Burmese. I couldn't write about Burma, honestly, because I didn't know Burma well. And you should at least have the humility not to write about something you don't know anything about. So I had to write generically. If there was a movement that wanted to bring a, a dictatorship to an end, how could they do it? And so I wrote those series, and they were serialized there, and we and published in English and in Burmese. And I thought that was it. The military dictators of Burma were denouncing my little publication from dictatorship to democracy, because it was giving some ideas about how the suppressed Burmese and other nationalities living in Burma could free themselves. That's why when someone simply carrying that little booklet with them and smuggling it through, when they were caught, they were arrested and sent to prison for seven years for carrying a few sheets of paper, rather than bombs or guns or anything like that. Dictatorship cannot stand this. Strange things happened. Uh, the edition printed in Bangkok in English was on display in a bookstore window in Bangkok. And there was a student there from Indonesia. He saw it and bought a copy and took it back to Jakarta. It led to that distribution under Muslim auspices and contributed somewhat to the democratization effort in, in Indonesia, which had also built, been under military dictatorships. And from there, we don't know quite how it spread, but it certainly did. I had gone to Beijing after the Tiananmen Square protests were well underway. That whole event, which it should be remembered, was not just in Beijing, but reportedly in 350 other cities of China. Similar protests were going on, but they were not planned. They were not prepared. There was no strategic decision. There was no 
advance decision how long you stay in the square and when you leave. What became very clear to me in retrospect was that the students in the square were operating with great commitment and bravery, but they really didn't know what the hell they were doing. The students had no plan. They were improvising all the way through. And later on, we know that many of those Chinese people who were out in the streets to bark there in another day were shot and killed. The attitude that you simply improvise and that the improvisation will bring you greater success is nonsense. It's actually the opposite, that if you don't know what you're doing, you're likely to get into big trouble. I'd never grown orchids before. I had driven down to Manhattan to see some friends of mine I had known when they were at Harvard. And uh, near their house, there was a floor shop. And they had some quite large potted plants of catnip orchids. So I bought two or three of those. They survived for a while, they bloomed for a while, but of course they soon died, but I, that led me to inquire about other ones and learning more about how you really take care of them and how difficult some of them can be and how easy some of them are. They take quite a bit of work. That became very important because it was something I could treat as they needed to be treated and not expecting miracles, but if you don't treat orchids right or anything else in life, then it's not going to thrive. to Budapest at the request of the International Republican Institute, which was providing support to the, to the Serbian opposition movement. And one particular part of that opposition movement was uppor. Uh, that's a Serbian word for resistance. He's a retired colonel and he has this type of the military approach and you know the way it speaks, it's really something that, you know, creates a strange impression with, uh, with a bunch of students' leaders. We talked for a while, and I said, well, something missing here. Uh, we haven't talked about who's the, le who's the leader of this organization. Who is the leader? And this one guy says, we don't have a leader. And I said, well, well, wait a minute, guys. I did not fall off the turnip truck coming over here. Somebody has to lead an organization that has mobilized the entire Serbian society. There has to be a leader to that organization. There has to be a leader who's coordinating all these demonstrations. There has to be a leadership that's getting millions of dollars in funding. And they started sort of laughing. So we spent probably one hour fooling him about some stuff. And the reason for this was that we were not very comfortable about giving the details about the organization to the to the foreigner and then they explained to me you know why there's no quote leader if you know, was to keep it away from the government the government doesn't know who's in charge and I later found out I was talking to the leader <laughs> Sergei Popovich
when Bob Helvey gave us the Gene Sharps of politics of nonviolent action, we were quite amazed. Partly I was, I was ashamed that I didn't know about such a book before, even if there was a translation of Fragmentation to Democracy in Serbian, but I never, I've never seen it. And seeing the knowledge of how power operates and how pillars of the support operates, and all of this stuff we needed to learn hard way throughout our experience, uh, written systematically in one place was a quite an amazing thing. And from that moment I know I will, uh, I knew I, I will read it, even if it was uh, quite a fat book, but uh, but uh, I didn't know how much it can influence the way we think, and also also I didn't know, know how useful it will be in developing our own our own future trainings. It's obvious that we are the majority. If we can just recognize all of those who are against Milosevic by, you know, saluting each other with a fist, he would probably be over within a few years. Atomization is when you the regime attempts to make every individual in the society an isolated unit. It's one of the main ways that totalitarian systems seek to control their populations, make them all fear of each other, fearing to speak out and to act together, never telling a neighbor or even sometimes a family member what you really think. And that's why it's so important that you begin with these very, very low risk activities so that people can put their foot forward for the first time, put their toe in the water of revolutionary change. That's the foundation that we work on is changing the obedience patterns, moving the obedience to a willing obedience rather than a coerced obedience. By seeing the example of the demonstration of bravery by other people, now it's we, now it's we, and we can do something that I alone could not do. During the 96, 97, we were walking day after day after day, and the police was blocking streets, and our numbers were start falling because it was obviously too boring for the people to demonstrate every day in a harsh winter. So we said, okay, why won't we go home and try to make noise from our balconies? So we start hitting pots and pans and they spread like fire throughout the Belgrade and other cities and radio stations where, you know, transmitted, oh, it is very loud in this neighborhood, oh, these people are using the loudspeakers, oh, there is a disco club joining the protest. And we were doing it from 7.30 to 8 p.m. as a response to the state TV news. That was the answer. The, this is what, we, we, we don't watch your crap. We do our own thing. From the pots and pans to doing the stickers, so the stickers can be doing in every building. And also the things like, you know, will you go and prosecute the kids for wearing Otper t-shirts when there is not one single law which bans wearing anything on a t-shirt? So, for the policemen getting inside the high schools, and arresting high school kids only because they were wearing the t-shirt and then going home and talking to their wife whose friend was complaining because her son was arrested having a dialogue with your kid who is coming now from his school where nobody wants to spend time with him or her because their father is you know beating kids from my neighborhood and now you know this systemic oppression doesn't work These pillars 
are holding up the government, like my fingers are holding up this book. And I develop a strategy to undermine each of those pillars, the police, the, the, uh, the sangha, or the religious institutions, the workers, whatever, every organization. And as they weaken and start to collapse, the government will collapse when those pillars are broken. Ideally, we want those pillars not destroyed, but transferred over to the democratic movement. If you want these pillars to shift sides, you need to co-opt people. You can co-opt people by two means. If you put a price on what they are doing for the sake of the regime, or give them the clear message that there will be a place for them in the future society. This is exactly what Otpor was done. We were telling the police that we are the both victims of the same system. They are pushed to do things they wouldn't like to do. We are pushed to the streets instead of sitting in the classrooms. There is no reason to have war between victims and victims. One war, one victims wear blue uniforms, other victims wear blue jeans, but there is no reason for this conflict. And this, this worked really worked. And it worked in Georgia, it worked in Ukraine, it worked in many other places in the world. This is the way you do. You go and co-opt from discursive pillars. You don't throw stones to the police. There are many people in conflict situations that really would like to use violence, but they, their opponents really have more military weapons and weapons of violence, which are usually physical weapons, than the resi potential resistors have. So if the resistors choose to fight with violence, the opponent has all the advantages in that situation because you're choosing to fight with your opponent's best weapons. But you can choose to fight with a totally different kind of weapon than these nonviolent forms which are much more difficult for the opponent to counteract. It's very difficult to build a nonviolent march because what you need is only one agent provocateur or only one lunatic or drunk person throwing stone at the police. So my question is you have 20,000 peaceful demonstrators you have one idiot breaking out the window, and these people got all of the media attention. So this is the message which can efficiently undermine your movement. Big concentration tactics are very difficult to control. So what we were dealing with is like you, you would always, you go on the march and there is a risk of the, of the people getting arrested. So what would you normally do? Instead of putting the big guys in front, you will put, you will put the girls in front. You will put the grandmas in front. You will put the military veterans in front. So the police is now faced with the friendly faces. And, and these people are actually carrying the flowers and the banners and smiling. So, you make the situation less threatening, so you make the, the possibility of the outcome really smaller. October the 5th uh, should be seen in a context of a successful strategy, and that was not the day like many spectators of media like CNN. They just see this big bunch of people, revolution, boom, and it's over. It was, first of all, 10 years of attempts and failures in two years of existence of Otpor, five different campaigns. And we were setting the victory on the elections. We knew that Milosevic will lose, and we knew that he will not accept the fact that he has lost. So there was this 10 days of increasing pressure that was very important because uh, not only we brought all the country to the standstill, including the general strikes, efficiently drug down the 70% of electrical power. And if you look to the genes mechanisms, this is called a non-violent coercion. So first you try to convert somebody, then you try to accommodate somebody, and then you go to the coercion. In non-violent coercion, your opponent, in this case Milosevic, was ready to continue the struggle. In fact, orders were given to the police 
to react against the people. But people were not responding to this orders because the policemen will know that if they shoot into the crowd of hundreds of thousands of people, including their own kids, they will go down to the sink together with Milosevic. They didn't want that to happen. But this is why this preparation period was so important because throughout this period, after victory in the elections and generally strike, we successfully explained to the people in the police and in the military that it is not, again, government against the opposition. But this is the people as whole Serbian people against Milosevic. <laughs> So around 3 p.m. you had like two to 300,000 people on this square and there was a non-violent takeover of the physically of this building. And this is where the people who broke into the building at the October the 5th found many leaflets pre-marked for Milosevic. So this is where we, you know, actually the physical cheat was taking place in the second floor of this building. It was more like symbolic takeover. Because what was the real takeover was that Milosevic lost power that day. Because police disobeyed, because he ordered the military to get from the barracks after 3 p.m. and they disobeyed. This is where he lost the power. What you were looking on the TV and physical overtaking of the building was just the symbol of him losing authority that day. I think what we learn from Bob and what comes and derives from Gene Sharp thinking and, and writing influenced the way we think and also made our struggle more efficient in a very important point when we were preparing for a decisive struggle. And yes, I think what Bob and, and Gene are doing is uh, precious around the world and, and we strongly believe that the nonviolent revolutions cannot be exported or imported, but the knowledge on how to successfully implement nonviolent struggle can and is transferred from one group to another as we speak. Well, I felt good that here was a revolution that occurred nonviolently. There was no violence on the part of the democratic opposition. And it shows that what Gene was talking about year after year after year, there are realistic alternatives to violent conflict. Well, I mean, after Serbia, we were, we were working with Georgians and Ukrainians and, and, and Lebanese and Maldivians and, and Iranians and Zimbabweans and Colombians and Guatemalans and West Papuans and the groups from places in the world I couldn't literally find on the map.
إذا كرفتها ما تزعل عندك صابون القرفنا بعد عشرين سنة بدون تغيير الموضوع ما هي عاوز ليه ودايك 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 وعصر 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 لكن النتيجة تعجبك صابون الجفنة إنتاج محلي من أجل مستقبل السودان Then from Serbia, the news spread to Georgia, which was under a very repressive regime, and then to Ukraine, which again had problems, and it spread there, and then to a series of other countries in the, in the stands of the southern tier of the former Soviet Union. В цих таких протестних середовищах панували доволі різні настрої, зокрема були люди, які готові були до якогось силового протистояння. Книжка, про яку йдеться, це книжка, книжка Джина Шарпа «Від диктатури до, до демократії». І головна думка цієї книжки про те, що з диктатурою слід боротися не насильницькими засобами, була дуже близькою нам. І це, власне, головна думка, яка сформувала десь протести, які вилилися в 2004 році в Помаранчеву революцію. Я думаю, що навіть безпосередньо з книжкою, з ідеями Джина Шарпа було знайомлено десь може, десятки тисяч людей. А з ідеями, можливо, навіть не розуміючи, що це ідея Джина Шарпа, і, і цими ідеями заразилися вже сотні тисяч людей, учасників Помаранчої революції. Якщо говорити про його ідеї, навіть якщо люди не знають, що це власне ідея Джина Шарпа, то я думаю, вони є дуже поширеними і дуже впливовими у світі. They've been waiting for this. They've been waiting for this knowledge. And Gene provided it. was really quite remarkable. I, I was thinking, I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed. This, this piece, which I regard as very introductory, I think it was maybe 70 or 80 pages to take off like that, it was a confirmation that the analysis was more or less accurate. It didn't spread because of good propaganda or some sales pitch. It spread because few people found it usable. They found it important. Uh, 
I've worked with uh, some people in Venezuela. I've worked with some people from Zimbabwe. I've worked with people uh, from Iraq, Iran, uh, Tibetans, and possibly a few others. And in most of that work, uh, I was promoting basically Gene Sharp's work and uh, the idea of strategic planning. Ah, don't you even think about that. When we first moved in here next to Bob, I was always afraid that someone would try to come in and get rid of him because he'd been all over the world doing all sorts of things. Uh, we, we bought weapons to, to defend ourselves. I was afraid to get, they'd get the wrong house and we'd, we'd be done. <laughs> what did you buy? Bought an AR-15 and a shotgun and some other weapons. That's not all. He's got... <laughs> Well, my wife wanted a pistol, and we were trying to decide which would be the right choice. And I was talking to Bob about it over the wall, and he, he brought me like 13 or 14 pistols. And he said, well, you use this for this or this for this. So it's pretty interesting. I had no idea he was so well armed. Hey, we, could, we could send off the army up here. There has been more done by nonviolent struggle to liberate people from communist dictatorships and other kinds of dictatorships than anything the Pentagon has done with all of its billions and billions of dollars for 40 years. And yet we can't even get a five or ten million dollar budget to do some research in this field. I finally concluded after many years, instead of spending my time trying to raise money, which was usually fruitless, I would concentrate on the quality of my work and the amount of work I was able to produce. And if people could see that work was important, then they could also say, see that it was important, they receive funding. We've had a sort of a drying up of resources, and we've had a lot of difficulty in getting support, financial support, for this type of work. For example, a story that I heard that a foundation was um, exploring the possibility of funding our work, and then I think there were some calls put into their attorneys. And very quickly they said, sorry, we can't do this. And uh, I think they, they feel that it's getting into a territory where we're, you're moving beyond uh, development and sort of building civil society and helping organizations. You're really trying to bring down a government. We had no contacts in Russia. Somehow or other, from dictatorship to democracy, got into Russia. This new translation was at a print shop in Moscow and was being printed. While the presses were operating, the FSB raided the print shop. The FSB was the new version of the KGB. And he looked at this item on, in the presses. He ordered the presses to stop and denounced the publication. He says that book is a bomb. The page proofs were taken to another printing press outside of Moscow and nevertheless printed. And they were on sale in Moscow in two independent bookstores that tended to publish dissident literature when they could. Quite remarkably, both of those print shops caught fire very quickly. And that was the fate of the free press in Russia publishing from dictatorship to democracy. One thing that makes me very comfortable is that the books are there, the literature is there, it's online, it's in people's homes and, and people's hard drives, and it's being disseminated at a level where that cannot stop and it cannot be stopped. People go to great lengths to discredit this work, and there was one case where President Chavez had referred to our staff as the bunch of gringos at the Albert Einstein Institution don't understand Venezuela. And I thought, well, it's true that we may not fully understand the situation in Venezuela. It's probably quite complex, but I'm not a gringo. 
And we also were accused in a book for having trained paramilitaries uh, that were being sent to assassinate President Chavez. And that, that training happened on a farm in Colombia, a country I've never been to. And I, I've never even held a gun. And, you know, it's, it's all very strange. Jim Chap, George Bush y sus ideólogos de este golpe suave mecha lenta, señores, este plan de ustedes aquí en Venezuela, olvídense. En último caso, en último caso, lo que pudiera ocurrir es una explosión revolucionaria. Jacobina. I have not trained paramilitaries, no. Jorge Sefid, Washington, D.C. Jean Sharp, نظریه پرداز نافرمانی مدنی و تهوریسیان انقلابهای مخملین که تعلیفاتی در این موضوع دارد وی از عوامر CIA جهت نفوذ در کشورهای مرد نظر می باشد <laughs> no, I, I was very delicately offered funds from the CIA at one point, uh, but I said no, and we have never had any funding or support from the CIA. It just hasn't happened. We don't do that. The video that appeared on the Iranian state-owned television alleging that Gene Sharp was involved with uh, plans to bring down the Iranian regime. When I first saw it, uh, of course, in a way I was impressed that we were on the radar, that they had Gene Sharp sitting at the White House. And in a way I thought, I wish those in the White House would listen to us. I wish they would request a meeting with us, but they don't. We sit here, we operate out of our two-room office. We have no connection with the White House. I was not a member of the CIA, never have been, never will be. And if you don't believe me, go fuck yourself. <laughs> we are absolutely not a CIA front organization. And it's really ironic because we see this charge in the press and among various groups quite often. And we always wonder, where is this coming from? Hey, you think I, I'm running, you know, clandestine movements all over the world from here with my two dogs? I will admit that I've got two smart goddamn dogs. And I sit here on my fucking hillside, and I don't bother anybody, and, but if somebody comes and say, you know, we need your help, if I can help, I'll help. There are thousands upon thousands of people streaming down through the main boulevard, all heading in the same direction. It's, uh, it's quite something. They're waving green flags. People are hanging out of cars, giving the V for Victory sign. I was not sure people would turn up given the warning, and um, I'm wrong. When people are slaughtered, when they are beaten, this produces a process of what I call political jiu-jitsu, in which the opponent's supposed strength is used to undermine the opponent by alienating more people from supporting that regime, mobilizing more people into the active resistance.
it's a kind of backlash effect. If the regime is so brutal, then instead of intimidating people, which the regime intends, it causes other population groups and institutions to withdraw their cooperation and their obedience, and the loss of power and control that more people join the resistance. When I went to see the chief prosecutor on the second day that I was in prison, he looked at me when I took off my blindfold sitting in his office and he said, do you know why you're here? And I said, no, I mean, I, I have no idea. I've just been arrested, you know, two nights ago. And he said, well, there's a very serious accusation against you. I said, what is that? He said, are you sure you don't know? Espionage. The interrogator kind of patted his laptop and said, you know, this laptop contains a Persian language translation of uh, Gene Sharp's From Dictatorship to Democracy, which is a handbook for uh, insurrectionists. And it gives them uh, several dozen easy ways by which, if they only follow these ways, they can overthrow uh, a government, a legitimate government, any kind of government. Um, and uh, I've, I've read this book and so have my colleagues. We see people in many countries in many situations that feel there is nothing they can do and that the steps they can take are mainly in sort of waiting for an external group to assist them in their liberation or to come in and help them by some means. And what this work does is show people that they themselves can be responsible for their own future, for their own uh, liberation. People are beginning to liberate themselves. You know, we don't, they don't have to depend on an outside power. Uh, this is Sergei Lycat, named after Sergei Popovich. But they don't have to depend on an outside power. They can do it themselves. And can you imagine how good that makes a country feel? that we did it ourselves. And that's why it's so important that we transfer the skill and knowledge. There's no reason for the United States to be occupying anybody. We're not good at occupying anybody. Neither was the Soviet Union good at occupying people. Let the people alone. Give them the power to change their government if they want it changed. To be counted as a threat to a tyrant is a matter of pride, I would say. It means we're effective, it means we're relevant. It means out of this very small office, we produce work uh, that, that threatens regimes. And uh, I think that's pretty cool, yeah. As my writings and research on this became more disseminated, we found people coming to us and asking us what to do. And people may be a little surprised. I don't tell them what to do. Because if I can tell you what to do and you do it, someone else can come next week and tell you the opposite and you do that instead. Yeah. But you can learn. مستنيين الحدث اللي يكون شراره اللي حرك الناس كلها بسرعه كبيره كان في محافظات كتير حصلت لكن الشراره نفسها اللي حرك الناس كنا مستنيينها آه ودي كانت تونس
بالفعل كان في اصلا بين مصر وتونس منافسه في كره القدم باستمرار يعني فقد يكون ده اللي يعني ازاي احنا بادئين قبل تونس و... ولقينا ان تونس سبقتنا وقامت بالثوره فليه احنا مش كده؟ كان كل الناس كاتبين على على الانترنت الاجابه تونس. طبعا بالتاكيد كان في تاثير جيد لكتابات جون شارب ومقالات كثيره وكتب كنا جبناها من الانترنت وقريناها وبدانا بالفعل نطور من ادائنا بصوره كبيره جدا وعرفنا جوهر فكره اللاعب بصفه عامه وكذلك شفنا برضو افلام وثائقيه كتير موجوده على الانترنت بتتكلم عن تجارب شعوب اللي بدات تتكلم عن او تطبق فكره اللاعب فكان في الهام كبير جدا للفكره نفسها سواء من الافلام الوثائقيه اللي شفناها او من كتب اللي قريناها تجربتنا مختلفة عن تجربة أدبر شوية، لأن أدبر قدروا إنه قبل الثورة يكسبوا الجيش والشرطة معاهم. إحنا مختلفين شوية، إحنا الشرطة كان طبعًا معركة كبيرة جدًا، والجيش كان واقف على الحياد طول الوقت وتدخل لصالحنا في نهاية المطاف يعني. فالتجربة مختلفة إلى حد كبير بيننا وبين تجربة أدبر في صربيا. I saw the developments in Egypt. I was quite amazed because they seemed so determined. They were being nonviolent. They, time and time again, asserted, "I'm not afraid." And many people were saying, "I'm not afraid." When there was really extreme brutality, I. I expected either the protesters may not come back again, they may submit, or they may, some may go into violence, especially when there have been some scattered violence in the square. كان من أهم التكتيكات اللي استخدمناها اللي هو كسر حاجز خوف عن طريق الممارسة اللي هو الناس جينا بتنزل باستمرار معانا طول السنين اللي فاتت فبينزلوا مظاهرات بينزلوا فعاليات بينزلوا أنشرة في أكثر من مكان بيتم اعتقالهم بيخرجوا أقوى منهم طبعا التكنولوجيا كان لها دور كبير جدا في في التواصل بصورة أسرع في التوصيل الرسالة للناس كلها وحجزهم أحيانا كان في دور للتكنولوجيا عن طريق تنظيم الداخلي ساعات كنا مثلا عندك مجموعات في المحافظات فأنت عايز تكون على التواصل دائم بمجموعاتك في المحافظات فبدل ما نعمل اجتماع كل اسبوعين لرؤوس المحافظات تمام ممكن عن طريق الفيسبوك عن طريق سكرت جروب على الفيسبوك عن طريق كونفرنس على الياهو او على سكايب او على بالتوك عن عن اي برنامج نستخدمه للتواصل باستمرار كل الحاجات دي ساعدت كتير عن طريق نشر الافكار ولكن ايه اللي خلى الجيش يسلم في الاخر؟ اعتقد ان الجيش اصلا من من الناس يعني مجندين الجيش جزء من من الشعب والجيش ليه دور وطني كبير جدا الشرطه قد يكون لها دور في تزويد الانتخابات في حمايه الفاسدين فمتورطين من سنين طويله وده دفع عن مصالحهم وعن بقائهم.
كنت لسه راجع من التحرير وداخل على الميدان من بواب التفتيش اللي كنا عاملينها باستمرار يعني وكان في كافيتيريا تقريبا مشغله تلفزيون مستوى عالي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ايها المواطنون في هذه الظروف العصيبه التي تمر بها البلاد قرر الرئيس محمد حسني مبارك تخليه عن منصب رئيس الجمهورية خطاب التنحي فجننت لما سمعت الخطاب يعني وقعدت عيط لو اخيرا يعني اخيرا الحل اللي بقالنا سنين استحملنا كتير عشانه حصل يعني كان يعني لحظة بجد صعبة دخلت الميدان بعدها جري وعمال ازعق لقيت الناس كلها بيعيطوا بيصرخوا بيضحكوا بيرقصوا بيغنوا كان طبعا لحظة تاريخية يعني ف... وكان احساس بعدها انه يعني مش مصدق يعني قعدت كذا يوم مش متخيل يعني معقول Somebody knew what they were doing. And we don't need anyone claiming credit for us or me or anyone if it's not deserved and if it's not documented. Massacre in Juma, 15 so far killed. Ma'ako Sama. Ani, alhamdulillah, I'll tell you the number of Tabib who saw the attack by the Maddamiya. This is a video of a kid who's been shot at. One brother is shouting, my brother, my brother. just a basic um, a HD camera linked to a satellite modem and we upload it on the, a streaming uh, website where we can get the live feed and we managed to get this to uh, Al Jazeera today uh, and they've been uh, broadcasting uh, the live images we were able to provide them with because they cannot send their journalists no one can you know not a news outlet not a single media um, outlet can send anyone or get any permission to film or yeah be there to verify The reporter our day on the CNN, I was talking with her, just sort of liaising what's gonna, what took place, what's gonna happen, and uh, what information we can provide. And the videos you've seen there on CNN, we have some people uploading these videos now on CNN, on Al Jazeera here, uh, Arabic, Al Jazeera English, um, ABC, uh, France 24, BBC, um, Sky. So we have someone uploading these videos uh, on their websites and. Um, we are already in in, in, um, in contact with uh, various media outlets now. If they need uh, confirmation of videos or uh, confirmation of, 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 of fact verification or eyewitness accounts, we can provide that. Without the modern technology, you wouldn't be able to make it. Oh, absolutely, the regime would have killed it in the put. Gene Sharp's. Uh, 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 um, tactics and, and, um, and, and theories are being practiced on the streets of Syria as we speak now. Uh, uh, the dynamics uh, 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 that the regime is facing in Syria uh, is what Gene Sharp spoke about and what we've seen in the early weeks and that was uh, what, we, what empowered people uh, and made them believe more in non-violent struggle that this is going to work and it is working.
what we did is promote these tactics and, and um, explain them to people through the Facebook uh, pages that we have and also the YouTube channels. This is how they're applied from you know putting flowers on the, on the spots where fallen heroes fell in the demonstrations, from graffiti campaign while you march, from um, uh, cleaning streets and making it you know nicer and better because we can do something even better than the regime can do in terms of uh, uh, services so yeah from dictatorship to democracy give you gives you the, the inspiration the assurances that this could really be uh, achieved and this can really happen We're going to see Gene Sharp and um, there's some, you know, critical uh, questions we have in mind. Uh, I know he might be reluctant to comment on a specific country situation because he always says, I do not have enough knowledge on the local issues and um, background info experience. But there are some strategic questions on a, on a macro level that uh, uh, we are facing and uh, it will be very helpful to get his insights, at least. Well, here we are. Try to find a place and here's a parking place in here we can park perfect when were you last here um i should not remember exactly was it 2007 or 2006 yeah years ago when it was only few people thinking about non-violence resistance um, uh, scenario in Syria no I mean only quite a few believe this can really happen in a country like Syria okay what set hi, hi Sama how hi. are you good, <laughs> nice good, to good see you, see you. Gene! Hello! Hi! Hi, Hi. Nice. Good, to you. You. Yeah. good to see you, yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. How are you doing? Not too bad. Health-wise? I'm coping. Perfect. <laughs> good to see you. Alright, so we've got some work, questions, advices. So let's no get advices. cracking. No, no advices? No advices. Alright. <laughs> I'm happy to see you. It's so good you have time in your schedule to come. Uh, well, the pleasure is mine. I was really uh, delighted and uh, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, oh. This is new territory for us. Yeah. Too. Yeah. You know, we've never been there personally. Yes. The cases we've studied don't exactly match. Mm -hmm. he, he's so humble and down to earth to a limit that you you feel how amazing this is. Like All these great uh, writings coming from a very tiny uh, little office uh, in old Boston, it's uh, it's it's uh, rather interesting. And by the way, there's one thing that's been learned in quotation marks, maybe from Tunisia and Egypt, which I think is a mistake, major mm -hmm. mistake, mm -hmm. and that is that the existing ruler has to resign. He doesn't have to resign. You take all the supports from out from under him, he falls. Well, no matter what he wants to do. This is the distinction in the uh, analyses between nonviolent coercion, in which he has to resign, but he's forced into it, and disintegration, when the regime simply falls apart. There's nobody left with enough power to resign. And if you're constantly waiting for a very stubborn 
so-and-so to resign, it may prolong the time he stays in some control, and even at the end, if he resigns under conditions, as he did in Egypt, that still gives him some control, even after he's physically gone from the palace. But because of what they if Einstein was the uh, genius in physics, so um, Gene Sharp is the genius in freedoms, and how to achieve freedoms. I feel good in a way that uh, we're spreading the word and if people follow Gene's advice on how to think about waging a nonviolent struggle, sooner or later they'll win. See, the advantage that we have using this form of struggle, the people against the tyrant, as long as we don't surrender, we never lose. And that's key. As long as you haven't given up, you haven't lost. I think in the long term, Gene Sharp will be a household name. I think his books will be in every library in the world. And they will be translated into most languages. Can we survive until then? Can this institution survive until then? Well, we certainly hope so. Politically significant nonviolent action has occurred in at least the following countries. Guatemala, Australia, Thailand, Burma, China, Japan, Georgia, Iran, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Serbia, Ukraine, Venezuela, Vietnam, Zimbabwe, and there'll probably be a couple more. I think there's a father-daughter relationship developing there. They can sit down and talk, and they're on the same wavelength. She protects him, and I think she loves him as a daughter loves a father. Gene Sharp is someone who is, of course, my personal mentor, but I think has served as that role for multitudes of people. He is someone who has dedicated his life to providing the means by which oppressed people can self-reliantly gain liberation. And that is something which I believe has changed the world and will continue to do so in dramatic ways. And I look forward to witnessing that and hopefully contributing to that. It's really personal. Sometimes people ask me what I really want. Do I have a dream? And I do. I dream that the oppressed people of the world will be able to learn from the available records and new experiences that this type of nonviolent struggle can be used to liberate all oppression and replace military and violent conflicts so that you won't have to carry on struggles against terrorism anymore because the people who might have become terrorists have instead chosen to use this kind of struggle to help out the oppressed people. This can change political systems throughout the world. My name is Gene Sharp and that is my dream.